In 2018, in the United States, homelessness and poverty have been increasing over the years. Wages remain low or flat for most people. Cost of living is increasing. Rents are skyrocketing as well as property values due to a speculative market on real estate and land. At the same time, federal funding for public nonprofit housing development is weak. This has all added up to what we see in the country today with the lack of affordable housing. When housing isn't available or affordable, people fall through the cracks and this leads to increased homelessness. To successfully solve this problem today, moving forward, requires us to first look back at the history of public housing in the United States to see how we got to this point and present some examples of housing models which might be achievable under current legal and systemic constraints. Basic History of Public Housing in the United States Public housing in the United States is administered by federal, state, and local agencies to provide assistance for low-income households. Public housing is priced well below the market rate. Originally, public housing in the United States consisted primarily of one or more concentrated blocks of low-rise or high-rise apartment buildings. It is provided in various settings and formats. These complexes are operated by state and local housing authorities, which are authorized and funded by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. More than 1.2 million households currently live in public housing of some kind. Subsidized apartment buildings, often referred to as housing projects, have a complicated history in the United States. While the first decades of projects were built with higher construction standards and a broader range of incomes and applicants, over time public housing became the housing of last resort in many cities. Several negative stereotypes associated with public housing create difficulties in developing new units. Perceptions of public housing include some major public concerns, a lack of maintenance, expectation of crime, disapproval of housing as a handout, reduction of property values, concentration of poverty, increased crime, and physical unattractiveness. While the reality may differ from the perceptions, such perceptions are strong enough to mount a formidable opposition to public housing programs in general over the years. Several reasons for these stereotypes include the failure of Congress to provide sufficient funding, lowering the standard of occupancy, as well as government mismanagement at the local level. Public Works Administration Housing Division, 1930s. Permanent federally funded housing came into being in the United States as part of President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal. Title II, Section 202 of the National Industrial Recovery Act, passed June 16, 1933, directed the Public Works Administration to develop a program for the construction, reconstruction, alteration, or repair of low-cost housing and slum clearance projects. The initial limited dividend program aimed to provide low-interest loans to public or private groups to fund the construction of low-income housing. Too few qualified applicants stepped forward, and as a result, the limited dividend program funded only seven housing projects nationally. In the spring of 1934, the Housing Division began to undertake the direct construction of public housing a decisive decision that would serve as precedent for the 1937 wagner stegall Housing Act, which set the template for public housing in the United States at the time. By 1937, the Housing Division had constructed 52 housing projects across the United States, including Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Based on the residential planning concepts of these 52 projects, composed of one- to four-story row houses and apartment buildings arranged around open spaces, creating traffic-free community spaces between units. Many of these projects were built on slum land, but land acquisition proved difficult, so abandoned industrial sites and vacant land were also purchased. The FHA institutionalized a practice by which it would seek to maintain racially homogenous neighborhoods. Although this practice was struck down by the Supreme Court in 1948 and outlawed by the legislation in 1960, Many white residents in Detroit in the 1940s strongly protested the creation of new public housing. When their protests did not help, they left for the suburbs, so-called white flight. In 1937, 
the Wagner Stegall Housing Act replaced the temporary PWA housing division with a permanent quasi autonomous agency to administer housing. The United States Housing Authority Act of 1937 would operate with a strong focus toward local efforts in locating and constructing housing and would place caps of $5,000 spent per housing unit. Construction of housing projects dramatically accelerated under the new structure. In 1939 alone, 50,000 housing units were constructed, more than twice as many as were built during the entire tenure of the Public Works Authority Housing Division. World War II era and the late 1940s. During World War II, entire communities sprang up around factories that manufactured military goods. In 1940, Congress authorized the U.S. Housing Authority to build 20 public housing developments around these private companies to sustain the war effort. The Defense Housing Division was founded in 1941 and would ultimately construct eight developments of temporary housing. Many became long-term housing units after the war. During World War II, construction of homes dramatically decreased as all efforts were directed toward the war. When the veterans returned home from overseas, they came ready to start a new life, often with families, and did so with the funding of resources of the GI Bill to get their new mortgage. However, there was not enough housing to accommodate demand. Efforts moved to focus exclusively on veterans housing, specifically a subsidy on materials for housing and construction. However, in the wake of the 1946 elections, President Truman believed there was insufficient public support to continue materials subsidies. The Veterans Emergency Housing Program ended on January 1947 by an executive order from President Truman. With the passage of the Housing Act in 1949, the role of the federal government both in public and private housing dramatically increased. Unhappiness with urban renewal policies came quick after the passage of the bill. Urban renewal had become, for many cities, a way to eliminate blight, but not a solid vehicle for constructing new housing. For example, in the 10 years after the bill was passed, 425,000 units of housing were demolished, but only 125,000 units were constructed. Public housing in the 1960s. No major legislation changed the basic mechanisms of public housing until the Housing and Urban Development Act of 1965. This act created the Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, a cabinet-level agency to address housing. The act also introduced rent subsidies for the first time, shifting a trend toward privately constructed low-income housing. With this legislation, the Federal Housing Authority would insure mortgages for nonprofits, which would then construct homes for low income families. HUD could then provide subsidies to bridge the gap between the cost of these units and a set percentage of a household's income. In response to many of the emerging concerns regarding new public housing developments, the Housing Act of 1968 attempted to shift the style of housing developments. The act banned the construction of high rise developments for families with children rising rates of vandalism and vacancy, and concerns about the concentration of poverty, these developments were declared unsuitable for families. Section 235 of the Housing Act of 1968 encouraged quote-unquote white flight from the inner city by selling suburban properties to whites and inner city properties to blacks, thus creating neighborhoods that were racially isolated from one another. Public housing units were often built in predominantly poor and black areas, reinforcing racial and economic differences and stereotypes between neighborhoods. Alternative models, such as scattered site housing, in which the housing is publicly funded, affordable, and low-density units that are scattered throughout diverse middle-class neighborhoods. The class action case that led to the popularization of scattered site model was Goutreau v. Chicago Housing Authority in 1969. The lawsuit was resolved with a verdict mandating that the Chicago Housing Authority redistribute public housing into areas less than 30% black for every one unit built in areas that were more than 30% black. Scattered site housing programs are generally run by the city, housing authorities, or local governments. Many scattered site units are built to be similar in appearance to other homes in the neighborhood to somewhat mask the financial stature of the tenants and reduce the stigma associated with public housing. Scattered site housing programs became popularized in the late 1970s and 80s. Since that time, 
Cities across the country have implemented such programs with varying levels of success. Public housing in the 1970s. Vouchers, initially introduced in 1965, were an attempt to subsidize the demand side of housing market rather than the supply side by supplementing a household's rent allowance until they were able to afford rent at market rates. The program had the effect of tightening the market for low-income housing, and communities were in need of an infusion of additional units. In 1973, President Richard Nixon halted funding for numerous housing projects in the wake of concerns regarding housing projects constructed in the prior two decades. The ban was lifted in the summer of 1974 as Nixon faced impeachment in the wake of the Watergate scandal. The Housing and Community Development Act of 1974 created the Section 8 housing program to encourage the private sector to construct affordable homes. This kind of housing assistance assists poor tenants by giving them a monthly subsidy to their landlords. This Assistance can be project-based, which applies to specific properties, or tenant-based, which provides tenants with a voucher they can then use wherever vouchers are accepted. Tenant-based housing vouchers covered the gap between 25% of a household's income and the established fair market rent. Virtually no new project-based Section 8 housing has been produced since 1983, but tenant-based vouchers are now the primary mechanism of assisted housing. Public housing in the 1980s and 1990s. Changes to public housing programs were minor during the 1980s. Under the Reagan administration, household contribution towards Section 8 rents was increased to 30% of household income, and fair market rents were lowered. Public assistance for housing efforts, however, was reduced as part of a package of across-the-board cuts. Additionally, policies resulted in the expansion of emergency shelters for homeless rather than permanent housing. More people became homeless as well after the passage of the 1981 Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act, which cut funding for mental health facilities. This pushed the responsibility of mentally ill patients back to the states. After patients were released from mental hospitals, there wasn't always a place for them to go. This resulted not only in increased homelessness, but also a more mentally unstable homeless population overall. The next era in public housing began in 1992 with the launch of the HOPE 6 program. HOPE 6 funds were devoted to demolishing poor quality public housing projects and replacing them with lower density developments, often of mixed income. HOPE 6 became the primary vehicle for the construction of new federally subsidized units, but it suffered considerable funding cuts in 2004 under President George W. Bush. There have been no significant reforms implemented since, but the problem still remains and continues to get worse due to budget cuts to fund housing. This means the community has had to step up to the plate without public funds to make progress on affordable housing for people in need where public institutions have failed to address the shortfall in available housing. This has resulted in the emergence of semi-permanent homeless tent encampments and increased popularity of tiny homes. Even though tiny homes are low cost and have low impact on the environment, most city zoning laws make it difficult to develop a tiny home community, even if you have the land. For example, many cities will zone their land to be single residential in most areas, which means that you can only have a few unrelated people living on the same piece of land, usually a maximum of three. This paradoxically means that if one is trying to build a tiny home community, they won't be able to do so in a residential area, even though it's meant to be a place where residents live. In order to solve the housing problem without the use of government funding, cities and counties could benefit from changing their zoning to be more favorable to building affordable nonprofit housing, either through tiny homes or apartments. Hopefully city, county, and state governments will be able to adapt to allow the problem of affordable housing to be solved. Unfortunately, as long as land and real estate is a speculative market, the chances of that seem unlikely. Affordable housing development doesn't bring money into the coffers of local governments, therefore it is set aside in favor of more lucrative development. But this ends up leaving many individuals behind. One can only hope that the attitudes and stereotypes around public housing and homelessness can be shattered so that real progress can actually be made to solve this vital issue.